War of the Worlds by H. G. Wells Book One Chapter Eight Friday Night The most extraordinary thing to my mind of all the strange and wonderful things that happened upon that Friday was the dovetailing of the commonplace habits of our social order with the first beginnings of the series of events that was to topple that social order headlong. If on Friday night you had taken a pair of compasses and drawn a circle with a radius of five miles round the working sand pits, I doubt if you would have had one human being outside it, unless it were some relation of stent, or of the three or four cyclists or London people lying dead on the common, whose emotions or habits were at all affected by the newcomers. Many people had heard of the cylinder, of course, and talked about it in their leisure, but it certainly did not make the sensation that an ultimatum to Germany would have done. In London that night, poor Henderson's telegram describing the gradual unscrewing of the shot was judged to be a canard, and his evening paper, after wiring for authentication from him and receiving no reply, the man was killed, decided not to print a special edition. Even within the five-mile circle, the great majority of people were inert. I have already described the behaviour of the men and women to whom I spoke. All over the district, people were dining and supping, working men were gardening after the labours of the day, children were being put to bed, young people were wandering through the lane, love-making, students sat over their books. Maybe there was a murmur in the village streets, a novel and dominant topic in the public houses, and here and there a messenger, or even an eyewitness of the later occurrences caused a whirl of excitement, a shouting, and a running to and fro. But for the most part, the daily routine of working, eating, drinking, sleeping, went on as it had done for countless years, as though no planet Mars existed in the sky. Even at Woking Station, and Horsell, and Cobham, that was the case. In Woking Junction, until a late hour, trains were stopping and going on, Others were shunting on the sidings, passengers were alighting and waiting, and everything was proceeding in the most ordinary way. A boy from the town, trenching on Smith's Monopoly, was selling papers with the afternoon's news. The ringing impact of trucks, the sharp whistle of the engines from the junction, mingled with their shouts of, Men from Mars! Excited men came into the station about nine o'clock with incredible tidings, and caused no more disturbance than drunkards might have done. People rattling Londonwards peered into the darkness outside the carriage windows, and saw only a rare, flickering, vanishing spark dance up from the direction of Horsell, a red glow and a thin veil of smoke driving across the stars, and thought that nothing more serious than a heath fire was happening. It was only round the edge of the common that any disturbance was perceptible. There were half a dozen villas burning on the Woking border. There were lights in all the houses on the common side of the three villages, and the people there kept awake till dawn. A curious crowd lingered restlessly, people coming and going, but the crowd remaining, both on the common and horsel bridges. One or two adventurous souls, it was afterwards found, went into the darkness and crawled quite near the Martians, but they never returned. For now and again a light ray, like the beam of a warship's searchlight, swept the common, and the heat ray was ready to follow. Save for such, that big area of common was silent and desolate, and the charred bodies lay about on it all night under the stars, and all the next day. A noise of hammering from the pit was heard by many people. So you have the state of things on Friday night. In the centre, sticking into the skin of our old planet Earth like a poisoned dart, was this cylinder. But the poison was scarcely working yet. Around it, in a patch of silent common, smouldering in places, and with a few dark, dimly seen objects lying in contoured attitudes here and there. Here and there was a burning bush or tree. Beyond was a fringe of excitement, and farther than that fringe the inflammation had not crept as yet. In the rest of the world, the stream of life still flowed as it had flowed for immemorial years. 
the fever of war that will presently clog vein and artery, deaden nerve and destroy brain, had still to develop. All night long the Martians were hammering and stirring, sleepless, indefatigable, at work upon the machines they were making ready, and ever and again a puff of greenish-white smoke whirled up to the starlit sky. About eleven a company of soldiers came through Horsell and deployed along the edge of the common to form a cordon. Later a second company marched through Cobham to deploy on the north side of the common. Several officers from the Inkerman barracks had been on the common earlier in the day, and one, Major Eden, was reported to be missing. The colonel of the regiment came to the Cobham Bridge and was busy questioning the crowd at midnight. The military authorities were certainly alive to the seriousness of the business. About eleven, the next morning's papers were able to say, a squadron of hussars, two maxims and about four hundred men of the Cardigan Regiment started from Aldershot. A few seconds after midnight, the crowd in the Chertsey Road, woking, saw a star fall from heaven into the pine woods to the northwest. It had a greenish colour and caused a silent brightness like summer lightning. This was the second cylinder. End of chapter 8